the hope of who Christ is. Who we have is in a relationship with God the Father through the very hope of the world. Lift your hands, your heart this morning. Heavenly Father, this day we are thankful. God, we are thankful for who you are and, and what you have done in our lives and what you are doing in our lives. But even more than that, Lord, we come before you grateful that you reached down and you and we were restored in to a relationship with you. Oh, Heavenly Father. God, I'm thankful that you turned things around. God, that you put us on the straight and narrow, the path towards you, Lord. And, and God, I pray this morning for those that are here in-house, those that are watching online. God, let our focus be of who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I invite you to be seated. Thank you, worship team. I was sitting in my office early this morning. Hopefully that wasn't me. Uh, and I was praying and and seeking God, praying over the message that He placed within my heart for you, and, and worship started to take place, and I could feel the anointing of who God is. Not who God was, but who God is in our lives today. And I rejoice. How many of you want God to do something for you? Put your hand up. Jimmy, throw that slide on there. How many of you realize that God wants to do something in you before he does something for you? Sometimes God just wants to simply do something within you. Because there's so much for who we are. God has a plan for you and I, and God knows that the very things we have need of are, are presented to us and provided for us. Scripture says, if you'll seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all the things that we have need of shall be given. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody remember what I spoke on? Uh, you can turn these monitors completely off up here for me. I, all I'm getting is a... Is a little bit of Scrooge. It sounds like a little humbug going on. Amen. Who can tell me what I preached on for the last month and a half of 22? No, that's what I've been preaching this year. What did I preach on at the end of last year? Grat well, we're shooting all over the place. Let me just remind you, I spoke of Generosity. Anybody remember those six weeks of messages on generosity? God is faithful. Amen? So I want to continue in some generosity. Uh, one individual I saw shake her head yes was Lee in the back. We spoke of generosity. Lee, you want to come up here and get something? Cool, come on. Oh, my. You want that cool sock cap? Okay. You're embarrassed now. Don't be embarrassed. Who are guests here this morning? Well, all the guests that are here this morning, or if you've been a guest in the last few weeks, come on up here. You don't have to be online. You don't have to stand in front of the camera. Don't, don't zoom in on them, okay? Pete, you want to come up here? You're a guest. You don't have to be on camera. Coffee cup, hat. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
There you go, Pete. See, one of the things about generosity is making sure that everybody that ever comes into the house of the Lord knows that God is here to give unto you. Did anybody show up this morning not expecting God to do something? See, every time I come into the house of God, if it's on a Tuesday morning when I am coming into my office to do work, or if it's me coming in for a service on Wednesday night or a life group throughout the week or coming in on a Sunday morning, I come expecting God to do great things. And if you have a problem with trying to figure out what God wants to do with you and what God wants to do in you, I encourage you to get into the Word of God, to spend time in prayer, finding yourself plugging in to his conversation that was written 2,000 plus years ago. The Old Testament before, the New Testament since. God has a plan for us. Amen? So I'm going to invite the ushers to come this morning. We're going to have the honor, the, uh, the privilege to give back to God for all that He's ever done for you and I. And I'm thankful that I have the heart's desire to be able to bless the kingdom, to bless the church, to bless ministries. So if you have your tithe, you have your offerings, just lift it up. If you, all you have is an empty hand, lift it up and allow God to fill it with some of his glory and his, his blessing. So Heavenly Father, this morning we ask, God, that you'll reach down and that you will bless the hearts here in this sanctuary, Lord, the hearts online, if it's live now or in repeat or on YouTube channel later. God, bless hearts that have hearts to give. God, we know that through your hand, multiplication takes place, and, and you bless it, and that's what we ask, Lord, that you bless our offering like you blessed the fish and the loaves. Multiply it for kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you, sir. I have a few announcements, and, and we're going to jump right into, praise the Lord, our message. I encourage you to stop by the information desk out in the foyer. Uh, there's life groups already out there, some options for life groups. Uh, something interests you, sign up in the near future. Um, there will be some other life groups coming out and, and being a part. And, and we just want everybody to participate in something. Doing life together, it's about connecting and, and being like-minded. And, and, and there's real growth in friendships that take place. For all the ladies in the house... <laughs> one, one woman went... Whoo. Let's try that again. For all the ladies in the house. Oh, come on. One more time. For all the ladies in the house. I don't know who's cat calling over here, but you need to quit. <laughs> Titus together, the ladies ministry here is hosting a game night on Friday February the 24th from 6 to 8 p.m. And they ask that you bring your favorite hors d'oeuvres and a new or gently used purse if you want to be part of the purse exchange. I heard something about the last purse exchange that somebody kept stealing one purse and I believe it might have been faith that got away with it. And a bunch of the women are going with their heads up and down. Men, there's... Trust me, I'm sure in your house there's an extra purse or eight. Um, but it's uh, going to be a time that you're going to play a variety of games, fun. Uh, you're going to eat, you're going to laugh, you're going to have a good time, you're going to get a new purse. And this is for all the 16-year-old ladies and up. They want you to come and join. So if there's anybody feeling left out, we have something for the rest of us. We'll be having a church family game night on the first Saturday of March, March the 4th. It's from 6 to 9. We'll start. We have all kinds of prizes 
to give out. Uh, we're going to start with bingo. Uh, it's holy bingo. No one get upset. It's, 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 uh, there's no money involved. Uh, and then after several games of bingo, we'll play a variety of other games. Bring your favorite snack. Uh, bring your family, invite a friend to join us. It's just a way for us to reach out into our community around us and let them know that coming to church isn't so scary. It isn't so bad. It's truly a family. And for all those that have already signed up for financial peace, or if you're interested in signing up for financial peace, there will be a quick meeting in the media room. That's the room off the back. It says media in green above the door. Uh, after service, Billy Joe will be hosting a meeting, a short meeting. And if you're a guest, we, we ask you just fill out a welcome card. It's a green card in front of you. Uh, if there's not one in front of you, put your hand up. Somebody will bring you one. I did not mean to embarrass any of our guests for coming up front, but we just want you to know that we appreciate that you're here. Uh, you are welcome in this house. Amen? Turn your Bibles with me as we continue the message. Moments to movements. Over this last month, the beginning of the year, I've asked you to pray and Ask you to fast, and many of you prayed and fast alongside of, of Annette and I, and, and we did things to where we could just simply come before the Lord and submit the physical man to the spiritual man. One of the very first in this series, we read to you Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and it talks about a great cloud of witnesses and how we should throw off, lay aside those things that hinder us to run the race to fix our eyes upon Jesus. We talked about who God was going to be bringing into our church, into our part of the family. I shared with you about the unchurched, those who have never felt welcome in any traditional church. That's the reason why these game nights that we're doing opens up some doors. Some of the other life groups will open up the doors. Some of the things that we're going to do in the future will open up doors for those that are unchurched. I talked about the overchurch, the ones who's had a whole lot of church but never really had a relationship with Christ. They go through the religious rituals, those requirements that says that, oh, we are a Christian, but yet they have no relationship. They never ask Christ into their life. And the third was a term that was new to all of you, the de-church. Those that love Jesus, but they don't like the church. In the second of the messages, it took two weeks to preach, but it was, what will it take? And I gave you a prayer plan and asked you to pray this way, even make a list upon and put it upon your, your refrigerator in your bathroom mirror. And I ask you to pray about giving you wisdom and giving you unity and, and giving you favor. Again, and not putting it on the screen, but the slide I had Jimmy start with was, you know, God's wanting to do something in you. And so we pray and we ask God to do the things that he needs to do. How, how many of you know that we're not perfect? Not one of us is perfect. But as we come together, perfection starts to happen. Why? Because where you lack, someone else will not lack. So we become one, and that's the reason why it's so important for us not to be this dysfunctional body of believers. You know, let, let me give you an example, especially for, for us old people. Some of you looked at me like, I'm not old. Yes, you are. Have you ever been reminded 
that you walk too much or climb too many stairs about midnight when your calves start to cramp and they literally pull up behind you and you did not realize that the heel of your foot could touch your lower back? <laughs> we don't want that. So in the body of Christ, we don't want somebody doing their own thing that causes discomfort. But yet we all have our purpose within the body of the believers. Some have giftings in areas that others don't. Some of you are, are given the gift of hospitality. Of, well, some of you have the gift of gab. You know, I start talking and I can't shut up. You know, it, it's one of those gifts that you have and you're thinking, well, Pastor, I really don't know what my gifts are. And you, you need to be reminded of where I preached before was what you find to be something that you're passionate about and that you're good at. That's the beginning of knowing what your gifts are. Then I brought out the message about leaning in, taking opportunities. And I shared with you that opportunities require a step. You have to make the move. And then I reminded us that opportunities have a shelf life. If we miss an opportunity today, we may never, never, we may never have that opportunity again. So we have to be willing to step out in faith when God's calling us or we see the door opened that we can either speak of him or, or water what seed's already been there. Maybe it's just a helping hand. But the opportunities have shelf lives. And if we don't move quick enough, we'll miss the opportunity. And, and when you can sit back and you can make this statement, well, God God will provide. Well, yeah. But you've missed the opportunity for God to bless you in the opportunity. I just a real quick, the little boy with the lunches, I asked God to bless our, our offering, our giving, our, our paying of our tithe like he did with the fish and the few loaves. Here's a little boy that gave, gave all he had, and he received what? A tremendous blessing. Twelve baskets full was carried to his house. Don't miss your opportunities. So when I think of making movements and, and doing those things, it, it's, 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 it's literally like this. A movement is just moving from where I'm at to one step over. That's, that's a movement. It starts to take place to where in some it's an effort to move from one area within their life to another but the more that you do, and, and if I, I, how I wanted a baby that was just learning to walk to be up here for an illustration. And how they'll hang on to something and they'll drag that toe out a little bit. Or, or you're sitting there on the couch and they're over at the coffee table, you, you know, and, and they're looking at you. And they start to turn. And they take that first step, and then all of a sudden, boom, they hit the floor. They climb right back up to the same coffee table. They'll do whatever they're going to do, and then all of a sudden they get that, that courage again. To Now, they just fell, did they not? How, how many of watch babies do this? As, as, as a Paul, Paul, I, I, I really like watching it. And they turn again and they start to move. But this time they get not the first step, but the second step and the third step. Even though they may fall before they get to you. They're learning how to, to make movements that now, as we are older, becomes habitual. You don't have to get a hold of the coffee table and... And make sure, that, well, there's some of us that need to get to the coffee table. <laughs> if I'm on the floor, I, I need a coffee table to get back up. But, but you know what I'm saying is there, there, there's a process within us. Once we have the confidence and we learn the ability, we can make movements. 
And there's times in our lives, church, that we, that we go from moment to moment. Some will call it from mountaintop to mountaintop, but the greatest growth is in the valley. The greatest growth in our lives is going through the hard times and the hardships and going through those things that we have to learn to lean upon who Christ is in the midst. This movement that God is leading us to, it's about involving each and every one of us touching somebody else, touching their lives. It's about people. It's just not about filling a church sanctuary or having 4,000 people watch us online. It's about touching people's lives. What we have is a place that we call home right here, but we have to get out of this area. We have to make the movement into the society around us, and we have to love them. We have to show them mercy. We have to show them grace. We have to have compassion to come upon us. I did a small little study about how many people live, shop, and go to school within a half mile of this church in an average week. 10,000 cars drive by this church, either hit Johnson or on National. In homes, in residence, within a half mile of this church, there's nearly 4,000 people living. The high school's just down the road. Moraine's just across the road. The other university is just a quarter mile away. How many people do we have surrounding us that we can take these moments that we have within this congregation. And we've had some wonderful moments. Lives were touched. How many had really a close encounter with God in the last month? These altars filled up. God answering prayers, doing things that He's promised to do. We move from these situations in our life, and we just create. And we have to create an atmosphere within us. Again, remember, God wants to do something in you before he does something for you. The atmosphere of praise and worship and the attitude of praise and worship within this church creates an atmosphere that Christ himself comes in. God, his word says that he inhabits the praise. And the more that I think about what's happening in this world the more burden for our community I become. Some of you are aware, some of you are not. But as of tomorrow, Annette and I have been your pastors for six years. For six years. Oh, well, it, it, thank you, but that's not, that's not what I'm saying. It's not about a celebration of anniversary. It's about God brought us here. He brought us he brought us out of 84 degrees up to this mess. And, you know, well, praise the Lord. I know. Uh, I love it here. But do you realize there are tens of thousands of hurting people? If the ice freezes thick enough, On Lake Winnebago alone, there could be over 9,000 shacks go out there with every one of them experiencing disappointment day after day after day. (laughs) Lake lice don't even swim through their hole. (laughs) Come on, we can relate. Well, at least one of you can in here. One of the most boring things I ever done was accompany John Wilhelms in his shack. <laughs> I just kept looking at that hole. The only thing that made it worthwhile was John was there, and it was wonderful. <laughs> but I had to look at his ugly mug because that's the only thing I saw was a reflection of John Wilhelms <laughs> in the water as he was sitting in on his little stool. I love you, John. But do you know there's that many people around us that's only one single connection away from finding Christ. 
Think about it. Only one. And you could be. You should be. That connection. Just one connection away from finding who Christ is in the midst of all their life. We're living in a society that people we're still seeing the running on of of all the disappointments of government and and promises that government has made and other people in our lives have made. The church this morning, I want you to hold fast to the promises of God in your life. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13, starting with verse 26, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Another portion of Scripture talks about the grapes was so large that two men had to carry it on a staff, and it was bent. It bowed. They all said it was filled with milk and honey, and it was just a wonderful place. Verse 28, what a horrible word. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. But I want you to look at verse 30. And I want you to hold on to this statement. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome. Say it with me. We are able. We are able. We're able to turn this city, this community upside down for Jesus Christ. We are able to break the, the song that was sung. He breaks every chain. We are able to introduce the people that are addicted, that are suffering, that are hurting, to the one that has the ability. We are able to walk them to the foot of the cross and do something great by just simply introducing them. Well, Pastor, I don't like to witness. Well, put and pop. You're witnessing either for Christ or you're witnessing not for Christ. Every day of your life, in your actions, in your voice, everything that you do, you are a witness either for God or against God. And if you haven't been told this for a while, let me remind you, all because you come to church don't make you a Christian. You can stand in the garage and you ain't going to become a Harley. You can go to the woods and you ain't going to become a tree. It's who we are because Christ gave us those opportunities. And sometimes I have to be funny just to make sure that everybody stays awake. But the facts are, this is serious business. Amen. This is serious business. Look at verse 31. Let me put it in. Whose report are you going to believe this morning? Somebody outside saying, oh, there is no reason, there is no purpose for a God, there's no reason to be in church. Are you going to listen to, to the good word of God? 
It says, but the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours in inhabitants. And all the people we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the, from the giants. And the next statement is, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. Now, there was ever a statement about stinking thinking. Well, I don't know how they saw us, but I only see myself as someone that can't do anything. That's not true. See, we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. It's more than just a plaque on a wall. It's an attitude. It's an atmosphere within us saying, yes, I can. I am able. As Caleb said, let us go now because we are Able, we are able to do what God's calling us to do as a church. I don't know what the next six years holds for Spirit of Life, but I can tell you this I know who holds me, I know who holds you. I know that we are able enough to go forth, not seeing ourselves as grasshoppers, but seeing us as mighty men and women of valor, mighty individuals that can go and take the land with a purpose. We can claim victory over our homes, over our families, over our relationships. We can claim victory over, over depression and anxiety. We can claim victory over those things that attack the mind by remembering who we are. See, I'm convinced this morning God doesn't make junk. We make bad choices. And bad choices takes us to places we don't want to go. But God has always given us the ability to turn and come back to Him. So what's the vision? I'm glad you asked. We need a vision. You need a vision for what God's calling you to do. The vision for this church is to create an atmosphere, the ministry that everybody that walks through the doors will feel accepted, loved, and concerned for. I believe we do a great job of that. But we need to go to the outside of the walls of this church. We need to find ourselves in our homes, in our places of work. We need to find ourselves as we frequent the same convenience store. Every morning you get a cup of coffee and you know the clerk by name. You know, you might go in, get you a Diet Mountain Dew, light on the ice, you know. Well, that's what I do. Uh, so we just, you know, you know. You go into work and, and you go by the same four or five people that's on the line before you. Every day. We have this vision that we need to write out for ourselves. Scripture says, without vision, people perish. I don't want to see our families perish. I don't want to see your families. I don't want to see your children and your grandchildren suffer anymore because they have not chosen to align themselves with Christ. But you have access to them. Only when they come in here, I meet you somewhere outside of these four walls, do I have access to your family. See, in the vision, there will always be someone doubting. Just like the ten spies says, oh, yeah, we saw it, man. You see the size of those grapes? <laughs> yeah, we saw. We saw what God said we would see. But in our own sight, we can't. Whose report will you believe? See, I believe we're in this place of having a Joshua generation. There is going to be people rise up. And they're going to find themselves going forth in what God's calling them to do. And mighty things will happen. 
how many pews would you need to have reserved just for you and your family if they all showed up? How much area would we have to have just to house just our sons and our daughters? My gosh, we'd all have to stand against the wall if all of our grandkids came. Why? Because there's a lot. See, we don't have to go out and try to win the world across the water somewhere. We have a mission field right outside this church. You have a mission field just pulling out and going west. Look at all the people. Do you know last year during soccer season, there must have been 1,500 kids on these fields just across the way. Joshua says, we are able. Caleb said, we are able. And church, I believe with all my heart that we are able. In Matthew 28, this is our inspiration for the vision that God placed upon my heart about going from moments to movements. Matthew chapter 28, then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. That scripture pertains to who you are sitting in the pews, watching online for me standing here. That all the authority in heaven and earth has been given to us for us to go. And the thing that God is asking us, Christ has told us, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our inspiration. God's calling us. Christ spoke to us and said, listen, this is what you need to do. What we have to determine within ourselves, and I'm going to be closing here in the next five minutes. Maybe I should retract that and say a little over five minutes. Put that all in picture up there. As that comes on the screen... We need everybody involved. Moments to movements, we need all in. All hands on deck. Pastor, I can't do much. You can do enough. You can have the ability if you desire. Well, Pastor, I, I can't move like I used to. Well, sit and pray. Speak life. Speak encouragement. Be able to cheer someone on. Because in the Hebrews chapter 12 where we started this entire series was that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Individuals that have ran the race and they're there to cheer you on. Well, Pastor, I can't run anymore. Praise God. Be a cheerleader. Praise God, be there that ones that, you know, for those that are not able uh, to go, be the encouragement. Maybe God's calling you to be the finance. Maybe God's calling you to be the participant. But we need all in, and, and this vision, we have to realize there is a significant risk. There's a significant risk because it takes us. Wishes have to be activated. Desires have to be activated. I shared yesterday morning at the No Regrets conference in the room. 
I'm talking about the promises of God just don't automatically come. They have to be activated. Scriptures like draw near to me and God will draw near to you. We have to draw near. We have to make the first action towards God and God will come. Annette and I have adopted this generosity mentality our entire life. Well, I should say our entire life of ministry. It's a mental state that includes the thinking about not just where we're at today, but what we want for tomorrow. And if you're thinking all I'm talking about is money, you are absolutely wrong. The Word of God says, if you want friends, show yourselves what? Friendly. Friendly. Annette and I want to be surrounded by friends. Men and women of God that are there as a support that we can support and they can support us. We want to see our tomorrows filled with, with men and women that are doing God's work because as a pastor, my whole goal is to lead you in the direction to pastor you, to be your shepherd, to encourage you. Some of you don't like it when I get on you. But a father upon this earth, Scripture says, if a father was not willing to correct his child, he hates the child. And guess what, sweetheart? I love you. Correction has to come some days. You know, one of the the things that, that always concerns me is when somebody says, Pastor, I need to change, and they insert the three-letter word, but, then it, that totally neglects and void what they want. The vision has to have a significant risk in this year, this year of 2023, We're setting our sights. I'm setting my sights on a higher destination. Giving God more room to move for who we are in this church. Come to the piano. Who's ever playing it? Thank you, Miss Jen. But we have to have a plan. In the second Peter chapter three, verse nine. This is the will of God. For the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, as some count slackness, but but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's will for us, the plan, is that no one should perish. You and I have a generous heart, but generosity cannot happen because we don't have a plan. You have to prepare to be generous. Generous in your time, your talents, and the giving of the Lord here in this church. Providing opportunities for others to know who Christ is. There has to be a plan. A vision has to have unity. Can I tell you that if we are all in the same boat and some of you are rolling... Your or the opposite way that we need to go, we'll ever get there. And I've said this before, and I mean it. If you're not going to help row the boat, get your oar up out of the water. Let's, let, the, let the restrictions be removed. But can you imagine how much speed we would get if everybody puts their oar in the water and rows in the same direction? Unity. I was watching a little thing on on the computer and there must have been a hundred people in this this canoe looking thing and they were all rowing in sync they had a guy in the back calling out now I've seen rowing teams you know there's only four or five guys this thing was over in Hawaii a huge long boat not real wide had an outrigger on it and man they're getting with it People on the left, people on the right, and they're all in sync. And it was flying. And I thought, wow. But you know it took more energy to get it started? Don't let this illustration miss you. 
It takes more energy to get something started to move than it is once it has its own momentum and we just continue to make it move. I ask you that you start thinking why God's called you. Don't think about what God can do for you. Start thinking about why God's called you. And then start thinking, why did God bring you to the who's in your life? Man, if you could see the intensity, some of you are looking at me right now. How many of you have the who's? You can understand the why now. See, in Scripture, it talks about the whosoever. That's the who's. The why is that none should perish. Church, we're living in the last days. I don't know when God's coming back. But this is what I do know. This Sunday, we're a whole week closer than what we was last Sunday. See, I know from my own experience of 30 plus years of it being in the ministry. I've seen single parents, moms and dads come into knowing who Christ is and their life starts to change. I've seen the drug addict, the alcoholic delivered. Just not going through a program, but true deliverance. I've seen shame-filled men and women from the things that they have done in their life bow their knees at an altar and come up literally their whole face is now changed. I was called into a house, a lady that attended our church. She says, Pastor, will you come? My, my brother's drunk again. And I walked into that, and, and there just wasn't bottles. There was those big jugs of gin that was just all over, and he was just laying there lifeless. And I prayed for him, and and he came into a place of being conscious enough, and I asked him some tough questions, and he says, I want my life to change. I want my life to change. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I said, it starts with Christ. I mean, you know, you can't, you can't get past some of these things in your life unless Christ gets in the midst of it. But this is a fact. As I prayed and he accepted Jesus Christ, the booze smell literally left his body and his breath. And he was saturated. When he went to the doctor, the doctor says, we don't know what happened, but if you would have stayed in that state, you would have died from the alcohol poisoning that was rampant and rapid. All the results of the testing show that somewhere you started to be cleansed. Fact. For over 30 years, I've seen children that had no one come into a house of God, find Christ, and be accepted. We became not step-parents, but we became mom and dads to children that didn't have any. I saw teenagers at the most important parts of their life accept Christ and things start to change. Young girls not giving themselves away to any guy that just smiled and said, oh, I love you. Individuals that were struggling and just literally filled with turmoil. And the last thing I want to share with you, stand if you will. It's very easy and it's very simple. Learn to trust God. Did you hear it? Learn to trust God.
Our God doesn't lie. Everything that you can read within the Word of God is truth. See, God's not intimidated by big requests, but He is moved by big faith. And every one of us here today, everybody that's watching online, we've all been given a measure of faith size of a mustard seed the word of God says can I tell you this morning we got to let it grow and we got to be intentional about making it grow creating around it church I want to see your family saved I want to see your friends I want to see your children and your grandchildren I want to see your neighbors come to know who Christ is. What a great way to build a life group in your neighborhood. Get them saved. Introduce them to who Christ is. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, the last scripture on the wall. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the scripture around that context is this where your heart is. That's where you'll find your treasure. Scripture says where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice that your family will know God? What are you willing to sacrifice that that people you work with will know God? Is it cleaning up, drawing closer to God, making sure that you're here, that you're involved, that you're a part of things, that you're growing yourself in a discipleship program, that you're growing, applying the Word of God? What kind of sacrifice? Does it mean that you need to get up 15 minutes early every day or you need to quit watching certain shows and you spend time with God? Oh, Pastor, I can't miss my shows. Do they still have all that, you know, days of our lives and all that stuff? I I remember my mom, she would miss everything to go make sure she was home to see that. Sand through the hourglass. Oh. What are you willing to sacrifice? The world's on fire. Are you going to wait for someone else to run in? Are you going to drop and go? Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, this day I am thankful that we are here and you're a part of our lives. God, I ask that as this goes forth, that, that Lord, I, I, it's not about what I say, it's about what they hear. Lord, let, let everyone hear your, your word and your promises. Lord, let them hear the, the, the influence of what the inspired word that you gave to the writers. God, apply it to our lives. Let us see that it's not that difficult that we just, well, God, we just got to let go of the coffee table. We gotta take some baby steps and while you're you're leading us by God with confidence, Lord, I know that we can walk not just simply by sight, but we we walk by faith and we walk by faith in you. So God anoint the mind and the heart. And God let us find ourselves saying we're in, we're all in. We're all in. Not all in, Pastor, but God, we're all in for you. We're all in for the kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I encourage you, if God spoke to you and
there's something going on in your life and God is doing something, will you reach out to me? Most of you are Facebook friends. If you're not a Facebook friend, request me. It's, it's John J. Rogers. And, but I would really like to know what God's doing in your life. So if you will, please. Be blessed. Don't forget, financial peace is going to meet in the media room. Feel free to go that direction.